question. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. What role do obligatory and supererogatory actions play in drawing closer to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala? What role do they play? Now, in terms of defining their role, uh, there's nothing that defines this, in my opinion. There's nothing that defines this in a more uh, beautiful manner, in, in, a, in a more clear manner than the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is reported from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's a hadith kudisi in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَنْ عَادَ لِي وَلِيًّا فَقَدْ آذَنْتُهُ بِالْحَرْبِ Whosoever, whosoever harms a friend, an ally of mine, a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah says, I declare war upon that person. Which is um, which is one of the only cases, there's only two cases in the entire sacred law corpus, Quran, Sunnah, wherein you find Allah declaring war against an individual. One is in the Quran, for those who consume riba after knowing that it is impermissible. And then the other one is in the case of harming a friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we can establish from this that before we speak about anything else, first do no harm, especially to the friends of Allah, Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal. Next, the hadith states, وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدٍ بِشَيْءٍ إِلَّا بِمَا افْتَرَدْتُ عَلَيْهِ No servant can draw close to me with anything except with what I, Allah, had made obligatory upon that servant. So this demonstrates very clearly that priority for us would be the fara'id. The fara'id, those obligations that Allah Ta'ala had uh, bestowed upon us, that he said, look, these are your duties. These are non-negotiables. Whosoever does uh, these particular actions, they will be rewarded. But those who don't do it, they will be liable for punishment. Similarly, part of what Allah made obligatory in, a, in an extended sense is that which he prohibited. That whomsoever does these actions, they'll be liable for punishment. And whomsoever, uh, does, whomsoever avoids these actions, they will be rewarded. These uh, masail, these issues in Islam, they are top priority. There is no benefit um, there's, there's, there's no uh, discernible benefit for someone who, who just skips over these priorities and they go towards supererogatory acts. That would be like the person who says, I want to be pious, so I'm going to stand in tahajjud all night and I'm going to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in tahajjud all night and I'm going to supplicate and I'm not going to make fajr. Right? We cannot uh, change the order of what Allah ta'ala had prioritized. We have to. Uh, begin ibda'u bima bada Allahu bi. We begin with what Allah Taala had begun. So that's the first part, or rather the second part of that hadith kudusi. Then the third part reads, thumma yataqarraba ilayya bin nawafil. And then the servant will continue to draw closer and closer to me with nawafil, supererogatory acts. And uh, this means that one essentially follows the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa ala alihi wa sahbi wa sallam's example in as much as one is capable of being consistent. So implement the sunnah, but importantly, implement the sunnah to the extent of your ability to be consistent therein. That's going to be the most effective form of implementation of the sunnah. Um, that's far more effective than to occasionally follow one or two sunnahs to the exclusion of the others, right? The most beloved deeds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, the best actions by Allah are those that are done consistently even though they may be few or little so what happens when we engage in following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is actually something profound we grow closer and closer to Allah as the hadith states but because of the consistency then Allah says until I love that servant Subhanallah. So that, that servant pursues this path, avoids the haram, does what is obligatory, and continues to strive with the sunnah, hatta ahbabtu, until I, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, love that servant. Which of course ties into our previous question as well. Fa'idha ahbabtuhu, and then when I love that servant, then the hadith explains Allah becomes our eyes with which we see, our ears with which we hear our hands with which we grasp, our feet with which we walk. When we ask of him, 
he grants us. When we seek refuge of him, he grants us refuge. This does not mean, of course, that uh, you know, a sense of pantheism that one becomes one with God. No, that's not the case. But instead, what this means is before we look with our eyes, our consciousness would, would enforce suitability with Allah. Meaning, can I look at this? Will Allah be pleased? If not, I'm not going to look at it. When Allah becomes your ears, before you listen, before you indulge in hearing, you first check with your consciousness, you check with your taqwa. Will this please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If so, bismillah. If not, I'll abstain. Your hands, your feet, before you grasp, before you walk, before you proceed, you will always be checking, does this satisfy my Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Before you, you continue. This is the ultimate form of consciousness and uh, this is why I look at this particular hadith, this hadith Qudsi, essentially as a recipe as to how to become a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a friend of Allah, as the hadith um, sort of alluded to in the beginning. Man aada li waliyan faqad aadhan tuhu bil harb. Whosoever harms a friend of mine, I declare war against that person. So what's beautiful about this is the simplistic manner in which we can traverse a path towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It all depends on our consistency and our efforts in that regard. You don't have to take huge strides. You don't have to uh, make huge changes, but there are priorities. And if you fulfill those priorities and you gradually grow along the path, then inshallah ta'ala success will be ours. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that. Barakallahu li wa lakum. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah.